Here's Grade. Thank you. Oh, yes, that would help. And thank you for the nice introduction. Um, just to, to prelude, if you get bored of my talk at any time, there's free oysters right over there. I promise you'll get them eventually. And we'll circulate them as well. Um, so, yes, bivalve curious. Um, I'm certainly that. Um, and I hope some of you are as well. Um, I guess the biggest thing is, is like, why, <laughs> why am I interested in oysters? How I, how I got interested in oysters? I'm not a marine biologist or anything. I'm just, I studied Latin American history in college. Um, but I worked at a fish market when I was younger. And, you know, we sold salmon, we sold swordfish, we sold everything. But I had this one particular customer who would always come in and really ask about oysters. Be like, oh, well, can you get this variety? Can you get this variety? Or how is this one grown? Or where is it from? And I think, who here likes wine tasting? I hope it's unanimous, right? Oysters are the exact same thing. You know, you have one grape, and it's grown in different areas, in different styles, and you get a completely different product. Well, oysters are very much so the same way. Um, you have two primary species, the first being the Pacific oyster, or Crassostrea gigas, um, which is probably 90% of the oysters you eat around this area. Um, it was imported from Japan back in the early 1900s, and now it's pretty much the West Coast standard for what we eat. Uh, and then you have the Crassostrea virginica, which is the Atlantic oyster. It's actually the only oyster uh, that's legally grown on the East Coast. Uh, you can't have any imported species, and it's the native species to that area. Um, then we have three kind of sub-oysters, and, and these are not the only species of oysters in the world, obviously, but these are the five species that we consume in the U.S., um, and I lost them somehow. But, uh, there we go. Then you have uh, Crassostrea sycamea, um, which many of you may know as Kumamoto. Is anyone familiar with Kumamotos? <laughs> Yeah, everyone loves them. Everyone loves them. You know, so that is its own unique species, also native to Japan, imported to the uh, Pacific coast. Um, then you have Ostrea edulis. This is the Boulogne oyster, the European flat oyster. Anytime you hear about French famous oysters, this is that oyster. Um, really, really unique oyster. We can get them in the United States, not legally imported, but they grow fairly in Maine. Um, and then finally, probably my favorite, is the actual native Pacific oyster, uh, Australia concophila, um, or the Olympia oyster, which we'll you know, get into much further, or in the, further into the speech. Um, so let's just tackle it right on. Everyone wants to know about it, right? Oysters is aphrodisiacs. So uh, is it true? Is it myth? What is it? Well, Aphrodite, the Greek goddess, uh, was said to have been born from the sea in some sort of mollusk shell. Uh, scallop shell, oyster shell can be debated. But the, the Greek goddess of lust, love, beauty, born from the sea in an oyster, in my opinion. <laughs> I'd like to think so, right? So there's certainly some history there. Um, next, Casanova. <laughs> Lay off me, Rick. <laughs> Uh, Casanova was famed for having eaten 50 oysters every morning for breakfast. Um, and he attributed his vivacity or vivacity to having eaten those oysters. Um, also, the very famous Roman uh, physician, Galen, would prescribe oysters for any sort of sexual ailment. Uh, Napoleon used to eat a dozen oysters before going into battle. And then all the way up to modern days, I mean... Go and see a, a, a Valentine's menu without an oyster in San Francisco. I, I, I dare you. So, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty well known. If someone says, name of food that is an aphrodisiac, it's typically an oyster. And marketers know this as well, um, at least those who are growing and selling the oysters. You got Naked, Boy, Naked Roy's Beach. Uh, you got the French Kiss Oyster from New Brunswick. You got Fanny Bay. I, got, I know I got one Brit in the crowd, so Fanny's a little something British. Um, <laughs> say he knows and I swear to God there's a naked cowboy oyster that actually is trademarked with the naked cowboy from New York um, I, was, I was actually in New York a couple weeks ago kayaking amongst the wild beds of, of naked cowboy oysters um, so what's the actual truth of this I mean the biggest thing is that there's two things um, historically any food product that has given a majority of its body mass 
to reproduction has been considered a some sort of aphrodisiac. So you look at figs, um, you know, majority of their body mass is, is promoted to reproduction. Same thing with pomegranates, uh, majority of their body mass for reproduction. Actually, good good quantity. Um, also, oysters, when they spawn, about 60 to 70 percent of their body turns into sperm or, or egg when they reproduce. Additionally, anything that... <laughs> Bear with me here. <laughs> Anything that resembles male or female genitalia has also been considered a, a, some sort of aphrodisiac. So I set this up on my 12-inch MacBook. It looked fine there, but here it is. <laughs> there, there's a pretty undeniable resemblance here, no? Um, I'm not going to keep it up there for too long. Don't worry. But anything that looks like, you know, some, some, has some sort of vulvic or labial characteristic has been considered a aphrodisiac. And just to be fair to everyone, you know, <laughs> we'll throw that out there as well. So historically, these items have been considered aphrodisiacs. Um, now, what's, what's kind of the science to it? Um, there's a couple things. One... Oysters are the, the uh, largest or the, the, the most uh, abundant source of zinc that naturally occurs, the second being liver. Um, so if you're considering aphrodisiac, oysters, liver, I'd probably go with oysters. You know? um, zinc is actually shown to produce, uh, well, lack of zinc is, is said to produce impotence in men um, and, and actual uh, good, good uh, levels of zinc in one's diet is, you know, Supposed to increase sperm count, increase uh, testosterone production, and such on. Um, second, there was a study by George Fisher, a uh, professor, uh, professor of chemistry at Barry University in Miami. Um, he did a study in spawning oysters, or spawning shellfish for that matter, that found that it had D aspartic acid, an amino acid that he then injected into rats and was shown to increase sexual hormone levels. Um, so there is actual contemporary physical evidence showing that oysters and shellfish are aphrodisiacs. And then in general, oysters are just a really healthy food. And I think when anyone else eats healthy foods, they feel better, they feel sexier, they, you know, you feel good. You want to kind of get lucky. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I got, I got a whole list of, of things that like oysters are. Just five oysters provide your daily levels of iron, copper, zinc, uh, manganese, um, abundant in vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D. I'm sorry? No, manganese. He's foreign. He's Turkish. It's okay. Um, <laughs> and vitamin B, my favorite. Um, one of the reasons for hangovers is vitamin D, B deficiency. So my, my job as an oyster shark, I can have a rough night, go in and eat a dozen oysters, feeling great. you know. Um, so that's another great thing about them. So, in conclusion, before we move on to pearls, I guess the, the thing about aphrodisiacs is, however you want to look at it, there's a certain romanticization about it. You feel good. There's certainly scientific evidence. There's historical evidence. Go out, have two dozen oysters, go have fun. That's my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, pearls. <laughs> As an oyster shucker, I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten this question. You know, like, hey, buddy. You know, he's like with his other friends or with a girl. He's like, find any pearls today? And I'm like, oh, no, unfortunately not, sir. But if I had a nickel for every time I've heard that fucking question, you know, I could actually buy a real pearl, I think. Um, but you need to understand, like, eating a dozen oysters won't actually get you a pearl. Uh, there are two separate uh, families, for that matter, taxonomical families. Um, the pearl oyster is Terida. Um, which is uh, mostly a southeastern spe species of oyster that produces those nice Elizabethan pearls that we want. And then if you look at this guy, this is a true oyster, or the oysters we consume, and you can see a little oyster forming right up here. Um, they're mostly just nasty little garbanzo bean, rabbit pellet looking things. Like all mollusks produce them, but not to the desired effect that we want. And moving on, is anyone familiar with the only eat oysters in uh, months that have R's? So there's a lot of, lot of evidence for this going back to even, even pre-colonial times. They think Native Americans actually had some sort of knowledge of this. And there are real reasons for it. But the first actually recorded evidence of it is uh, William Butler, who was a physician to King James I of England. 
And uh, he said, it is unseasonable and unwholesome in all months that have not an R in their name to eat an oyster. Um, I wish we spoke like that. You know, it just sounds so much better. Um, so that's the first evidence of it that actually we have recorded. Um, and it moves all the way up into, into um, modern day culture. Uh, I found this. It was from a funny book number six from 1943. And this shows how prevalent it is, or at least it was in the 1940s. Um, they made a comic book about it. Um, Otto the Outcast Oyster, who was born with the, the unfortunate birthmark of an R on his head. And no one wanted to hang out with them because they thought they'd get eaten. Um, so it's, it's a really culturally systemic belief. And there are some reasons for it. So kind of what are they? Um, one, oysters both hibernate and spawn in different times of the year depending on water temperature. Um, in the summer, an oy- or, I mean in the winter, an oyster will really be fat. They build up these glycogen reserves because they shut down for the really cold months. Uh, and they, they try to build up these reserves so they can essentially hibernate and not open and not feed. These are the months of December, January. Um, so when you eat an oyster in December or January, it's going to be really fat, really juicy, all these rich sugars in it. You know? And then in the summer, if anyone's had a really spawny oyster, like this guy right here, it's just kind of a creamy, nasty, milky bomb that you don't really want to eat. Um, I know we're in August. I know we're in August. Trust me, I have some very good oysters. Um, <laughs> But people have moved around this. What they have done is they've created a triploid oyster, which is an oyster that has three chromosomes and it's non-gendered, so it never breeds. So you never get this nasty, spawny mess. Um, so, And don't worry about triploid oysters. It's not like people are genetically engineering things that are crazy. A lot of the, a lot of the items that you do eat are triploids, like tomatoes, uh, you know, all sorts of fruits and veg are triploids. So it's not crazy GMO Monsanto shit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, second, uh, when, <laughs> when waters get warmer, they generally breed more bad bacteria. Um, and this is, I have an oyster vendor, uh, his name's Lou. And when times are tough, he's like, man, everything's closing down. You better serve a penicillin mignonette, you know? Um, but in warmer waters, they do breed more dangerous bacteria. Uh, so, but however, there is federal regulation and, and very close monitoring of these grounds. I mean, you're, you're honestly more at risk eating some tainted spinach from certain areas of the world or, or you know, peanut butter. I've, there, there are more cases of peanut butter sickness and, and, and spinach sickness than there actually are recorded oyster illnesses. Um, and then the biggest one is, not the biggest one, but when I was working at the fish market, I swear to God, as soon as October hit, we get all these adorable little grandmothers coming in and buying all these oysters in, in high volume because after a long and bivalve bereft summer, they could finally eat oysters again. And this goes all the way back to the 1800s, the 1900s, when there was no reliable um, refrigerated shipping. I mean, you look at this oyster stall up here, that's an image of an oyster stall like 1850s, 1860s New York. Um, I guarantee you that wasn't hygienic or well iced down like our oysters over here. And this is actually a contemporary picture from France, uh, taken about you know, nine months ago from a friend of mine who lives up in Vermont who took a, a, a trip to France. And they don't apparently ice their oysters either. Um, but anyway, on a warm summer you know, day, you wouldn't catch me eating an oyster in 1850s New York or modern day France. <laughs> yeah. um, so it does have certain truth to it, but so long as you're, you're eating oysters at a reputable establishment or you at least know what you're doing, um, you can certainly enjoy oysters year-round. Um, continuing on with the refrigeration and, and kind of moving into a little bit of the history of oysters, um, oysters of mankind have not only have, have been intertwined for a long time, mostly to the oyster's detriment. Um, Pre-Columbian societies down in the Andes used to use spondylus or pearl oysters as currency. They used their shells as the closest form of currency they had. Some people will say that, you know, uh, Incan culture was not actually um, a capitalist society, but it's not for this conversation. Uh, but they did use them as close, close to a form of currency. Um, all over North America, you find these shell middens. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Emeryville shell midden. Um, And actually, the the Chesapeake is an Algonquin word for great shellfish. So a lot of Native American cultures fully depended on oysters as a main staple protein. 
Another thing is the, the Greeks used them as uh, used oyster shells as ballots in their voting. Uh, whenever they were casting votes, they would use oysters. And if you put an oyster shell down, it meant yes. If you or a vote for yes or a po- oyster shell up, it meant a vote for no. Uh, early American colonists even used oyster shell to build a lot of um, streets and everything and, and buildings and edifices to, to you know, establish towns and colonies. Um, oysters didn't really take off, and this is all going to be very brief because I didn't have much time to delve into the history, but oysters really took off in New York around the 1820s, 1830s. Um, it was when the, when, the, when the Dutch actually arrived, it was estimated that 50% of the world's oyster population was in New York Harbor, um, and they quickly started to wipe that out. But, you know, back, back in, the, in the 19th century, people thought that oysters and New York were pretty much synonymous, and they were. You could either make a living go, off oysters, go to any one of these, you know, little oyster cellars, buy oysters, um, rich people, poor people, everyone ate oysters. It was, it was very popular. And I think my favorite story about New York and oysters is, back to the aphrodisiac thing, oyster cellars in, in 19th century New York and brothels were pretty much one and the same. <laughs> it makes sense, right? Yeah. And these cellars would denote their sale of oysters and ladies, I guess you would say, uh, with a red with a red balloon, uh, with a candle inside of it. That's how they would they would note an oyster cellar. And some people believe the first actual uh, recorded uh, use of the term red light district is in the 1894 Sandusky Register. These red light balloons were happening back in the 1850s, 1860s. So some people do believe that the term red light district comes from oyster cellars in 1850s, 1860s New York. Kind of an interesting little tidbit there. Um, moving on. Uh, is anyone familiar with the term blue point? Anyone heard of blue point oysters? Yeah? So probably the most abused appellation of oysters. The, the funny thing about oysters is that they don't have any product designation of origin. Like, you can call an oyster whatever the hell you want. You know? um, whereas something like champagne or, or Vidalia onions or tequila... They have legal definitions, um, whereas the Blue Point Oyster does not, uh, or at least did not until this is an actual genuine Blue Point Oyster. And the cool thing about the Blue Point Oyster is, is that it was such a popular oyster that the name was coined by Joseph Avery in, in I think, around 1819. And uh, it became so popular that you started finding New Jersey Blue Points. You started finding Louisiana Blue Points, Virginia Blue Points. But there is an actual true Blue Point. And in 1909... 1908, excuse me, um, there was an actual product designation of origin uh, law passed within New York, New York. However, it's not recognized whatsoever. And anyone call a blue point a blue point. But there is an actual genuine blue point from the great South Bay of New York that you can try. We have them at our restaurant. I suggest you come in and try them. Very, very great oyster. All right. um, next, moving west to San Francisco. Um, the Bay Area has a very rich half-shell history, if you will. Um, this is a picture of the actual uh, Emeryville shell midden before it ca- became a fucking gap. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it did exist. It did exist. So we talked about shell middens. That was a real thing. Um, but when the 49ers showed up, uh, oysters were very popular, very abundant. People sailing into, New- or into San Francisco Bay, or estuary more accurately, the ships would actually go ashore on oyster reefs. They were so abundant. And this was actually the native oyster, um, the Olympia oyster we talked about beforehand. And Mark Twain was such a big fan of them, uh, he said that the Occidental Hotel, um, which is, I believe, on Montgomery, or no, Sansom and Bush in, in San Francisco, somewhere around that area. It's no longer there. He said that this place was heaven on a half shell. And uh, other interesting note, this is actually where they claim the martini was invented. So oysters, martinis, I'm sure... Good old Mark had a, uh, had a good time there. Or Sam, whatever you want to call him. You know. um, so uh, San Francisco was a very, very prevalent oyster area. And the native oyster, the Olympia, was quickly overfished. They even started importing uh, Pacific or Eastern oysters to start growing them. But I think all this history would go on forever. I think the, the most interesting story is that of Placerville. Does anyone know where Placerville is? Yeah, it's about 100 miles no- or east, northeast of here. Um, it used to be called Hangtown, 
And this is a picture of where it is. And uh, historic Plasterville, or Hangtown, um, is on the left. Now, Hangtown was an old school mining town right around the 49er era. Um, and it was named Hangtown because with all these new rich people coming in, obviously there were seedy characters flowing in trying to relieve them of this newly found wealth. Um, so there's two stories. One, the Hangtown Fry. Um, before I get into the stories, the Hangtown Fry is an omelet. Is anyone familiar with this? Hangtown Fry? It's an omelet with bacon, oysters, spinach, and eggs. Well, omelet, um, obviously. Um, so it's a very popular traditional California cuisine. And there's a couple stories behind it that was created. Uh, the first being that uh, a man had just hit pay dirt, got a bunch of gold, walked into the El Dorado Hotel in Hangtown, and asked for the most expensive meal. And he said, I've got oysters, eggs, and bacon. Uh, very expensive items. Eggs need to be carted in very carefully to this mining town. Uh, bacon had to be shipped from the East Coast. And oysters need to be shipped from the coast, 100 miles inland. Uh, the story I like, which is m most likely apocryphal, um, but still really cool, is that this guy was on death row, and for his last request for a meal, he said, I want oysters, eggs, and bacon, knowing full-fledgedly that they all needed to be shipped into town, perhaps delaying his execution by quite a few days. Pretty clever, in my opinion. You know? Who knows if it's true? Um, that's my little version of a hangtown fry. I had a lot of fun making that. Um, and my buddy who's shucking oysters, he's the photographer. You know. um, so anyway, very, very rich and abundant half-shell history in, in San Francisco. And it slowly started to, clap, to collapse. You know, like we had all these oysters. And uh, what really happened, I mean, you saw around the 1920s, you know, San Francisco Bay was closed. You, you can't harvest live shellfish from San Francisco Bay. We all see this beautiful bay, and it's a shell, no pun intended, of what it once was. You know, it's cloudy, it's disgusting, it's gross. So what really happened? Uh, one was hydraulic mining. Um, you know, with all the gold rush, everything, they started blasting away this, this huge amounts of earth that would all be flowing down into our watershed eventually into San Francisco Bay, causing huge silt buildups and covering oyster, oyster beds. Uh, two, overfishing and dredging. You know, the, the best analogy I can think of is Imagine someone taking a 200-foot bulldozer, you know, and just going over the rainforest. That literally does happen. But that's essentially what oyster dredging would do to the bay, you know, back in the day. Um, just literally destroying entire ecosystems. And then, obviously, pollution. Um, oysters can already fight it for so long. You know. This is a graph demonstrating uh, the decrease of oyster landings in the Chesapeake uh, from 1880 all the way to 2008. I mean, it's pretty incredible. You know, they were, they were landing 120,000 pounds of oysters all the way up to 2005, where maybe it's 500. You know, we've, modern day oysters are functionally extinct. I'm sorry? Landing. That's how much they harvest. When you, when you take a harvest in and you land it at an actual physical port, that's how they quantify it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That, that's, I mean, it's pretty incredible how, how drastically it decreased over less than 100, a little over 100 years. You know, there's really no, not any wild oysters left. So how do I have a job? Like, how do I still shuck oysters, I guess? Well, 95% of the oysters we eat nowadays are farmed. And this is an oyster larvae. Um, they're grown in hatcheries primarily, at least within North America. Um, and the, the cool thing about these is one million of these little guys can fit right on your fingernail. Um, they're super tiny. What they do is they, th they throw them in these, uh, these hatchery systems in which they adhere to pulverized oyster shell, and they start growing into little baby seed oysters. And once they get of age, you know, maybe within, I don't know, anywhere from six weeks to, to 12 weeks, they throw them in a bag. And there are multiple ways of farming oysters, but this is pretty much what happens in Tamales Bay. Uh, they throw them in a bag, and then they throw them on these racks. Um, and they just let them sit there. You know, obviously they monitor water quality, um, but it's a pretty low-maintenance job uh, if you just want a basic, you know, Pacific oyster. And the end product is hopefully this. And the coolest thing about oysters, I feel, is that they're really, really low-impact farmed uh, protein. 
You know, uh, I kind of extrapolated this graph from a number of things. But you have beef, chicken, and farm salmon. Um, and you have the feed conversion ratio per pound. So for every one pound of beef, you need to put seven pounds of, of feed into that animal just to get one pound. That means grain, corn, whatever, grass, whatever it be. Chicken's about two to one. Salmon's pretty good at one to one. But oysters don't even matter. We don't put any feed into them. They just sit there and filter water. You know, it's, it's completely, we, we don't add anything to them. You know? um, same thing with fresh water usage. usage. Uh, I took this from a number of studies, um, primarily a guy at the University of Twente uh, in the Netherlands, in which he had three different categories of water footprints. One was green water usage, one was blue water usage, one was gray. I just took the green, which was the actual water, or which was the, the amount of water that needed to go into growing crops to feed animals, and two, the blue, which was the actual consumption of water. The gray was the uh, pollution that would go into actually harvesting the animals. So I excluded that from oysters because there obviously is a little impact there. But, I mean, uh, to get a pound of beef, you have to use 2,500 uh, gallons of fresh water. Chickens, 700. Farmed salmon, uh, 22. Oyster, nothing. Uh, no, that's the citation of where I got it. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. That'd be a lot more, actually, in theory. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that's a citation. So basically the point is oysters are a very, very low-impact protein. And my point is eat more oysters. You know, uh, with, with all these population boom, I've been reading that uh, Dan Brown book, Inferno. Sorry, I apologize. But is anyone reading that? You guys are all smart, so you probably don't. Um, but it's talking about all this population boom and, like, the scarcity of fresh water and everything. And so hopefully we can do the best we can. But actually, my, my friend had a very good line about Dan Brown books. He said, it's like McDonald's, you know. Um, you eat it really fast and you think it's really good, but once you finish it, you're just like, I just ate a bunch of shit, man. <laughs> and I, kinda, I agree with that, actually, but I like them, so leave me alone. <laughs> um, and then the biggest thing that I really wanted to, to convey about oysters is what their, their environmental impact. I mean, oysters are really the coral reefs, the, the mangroves of the temperate zone where we live, and they're pretty much gone, you know. Um, oysters take all this nitrogen out of the water, all this wastewater that we pump into to our watershed is removed by oysters or potentially could be removed by oysters. They take in algae, they take in phytoplankton, all these things that breed on nitrogen, and they, they remove that from the water, filter it through as biodeposits, which is an example here, and then convert it into na organic nitrogen as their biodeposit. And all this improves water clarity, improves oxygen in the water, which, you know, just trickles up or trickles down to all sorts of plant life, all sorts of crabs, salmon. I mean, oyster reefs really are the coral reefs of temperate zones. They, they just are the areas where life is. And we pretty much have none. That's why the bay looks like shit. You know? um, this is just a brief, uh, for, for the sake of time, I'll kind of skip over this. Um, but this is just like a brief scale of a, or a brief example of the the ecosystem stressors to oysters and, and the benefits provided by them. Um, but moving on. So these are examples of, and Chris Lim, this gentleman right here. Oh, where's my pointer? Right there. He's in theater too, if you want to talk to him. Um, but this is an example of all the modern day oyster restoration projects that are going on to really rebuild our oceans because, I mean, what happens to the oceans happens to us. You know, so it's it's a very vital thing. Uh, this is an example of in New York, where they're they're just dr are dumping uh, oyster shell all throughout New York Harbor. Uh, this is an example down here on the left, um, in the Chesapeake, where they're planting a oyster reef, in which oyster shells will hopefully naturally adhere to and create natural oyster reefs. And then this is Chris Lim measuring. Um, what sort of oyster existence or, or what actual biota is within uh, a certain area of uh, Point Pinole, just north of Richmond. Um, so um, there is evidence that, that oyster restoration can work. This is Blaine, Washington, uh, which is right on the, the uh, waterfront of Drayton Harbor. And wild, uh, wild shellfish harvesting was closed there in 1996. Um, and the citizens of Blaine said we need to kind of do something about this. So in 2001, 
uh, they started the Drayton Harbor Community Oyster Farm in which they were trying to rebuild the water quality of the area. Um, and sure enough, with efforts on land to reduce pollution and with a thriving oyster population, they were able to uh, feasibly harvest shellfish in 2005, four years after they started it. So there is evidence that this can work. You can bring back watersheds. You can bring back life to these dead harbors, to these dead bays. Obviously, this is a microcosm. This isn't the solution for a San Francisco Bay immediately, but it is evidence that it works. Oh, there we go. Um, so that brings us back to our local Bay Area one. Uh, my buddy Chris, who's in the other room, uh, he works for uh, the Watershed Project in a, pro in a program uh, called the Living Shoreline. Um, I got to join him at a field trip to Point Pinole, um, up uh, just north of Richmond. And this is the, these are the oyster grounds at low tide. Um, and this is an example of a living Olympia native oyster that I pulled out of the water. Now, optimistically, um, hopefully within the, well, within the next few months, they'll be spreading out about 100 of these oyster balls um, all around this area. And the idea is that all these native oysters will start adhering to this ball and creating natural reefs. So eventually, it may just look like this, you know, bring the bay back to what it once was. Because a healthy watershed, healthy bays equal healthy humanity and a healthy ecosystem in general. Um, so yeah, that, that about sums it up. I hope all of you uh, take a little interest in your local watersheds and your local oyster populations and try to strive for this. Eat some oysters. <laughs> that's the Chesapeake. Yeah, that's the region of the Chesapeake. Um, but optimistically, it could be us within 20, 30 years. We'll see. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Um, hopefully... That's the last oyster? Did everyone get one? Oh, I didn't even notice. All right, I'm going to eat one then. Enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, given my presentation, you obviously know where I stand on Drake's Bay. So if you want to address that, we can certainly talk in private, but I'm sure that's a whole conversation we could have. Uh, anyone else? Um, mercury, okay, so he's asking if I have a worry about buildup of prescription drugs. I've never heard that one before, but mer mercury is a big thing. Um, mercury is existing in all seafood, and usually um, it's just the longevity that, or, or the length of time that any species lives in the water, its mercury level is going to, you know, increase and increase. Um, a big example is orange roughy. Has anyone heard of orange roughy, a fish from, like, New Zealand? That fish is about 140 years old. It has some of the highest mercury levels of any fish that we eat. Um, so it's just the longer a species is in the water, the more mercury it has. Swordfish is also another big concern. Some tuna, the larger tuna, are a big concern as well. But oysters, uh, we harvest them typically within 18 months to maybe, at best, six, seven years. So they really do not have high mercury levels whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so Uh, that, that's, that's a big thing that people are currently studying. I, I think that being oysters are cluster species, they like to adhere to other oysters or other oyster shells. So that's been the most successful thing. That's why when in hatcheries, they actually pulverize these shells down to, you know, grains of pepper, and then oysters will adhere to those. Um, they've tried some other things like, you know, natural ceramics and stuff like that, but still a natural oyster shell is the best thing that they've found. Biologically, I don't know why they had go to it, but I don't know, for me it makes sense, you know, like begets like, something like that, you know. I uh, got being pointed at the balcony by this gentleman. Uh, this is a Marin Miyagi um, from Tamales Bay. It's grown in the rack and bag style that we saw. Um, it's probably about 18, 18 months old, I'd say. Um, and the biggest thing, I didn't put out any lemon or lime or hot sauce because, like I said, oysters are like wine, they taste very different, so... It's just tasting this oyster naked or, or in its purest form, you really get those flavors of like, you know, super briny and then kind of bitter herb, you know, kind of lettuce-y type thing going on, which is very unique to Tamales Bay. 
I feel, at least culinarily speaking. Back right. <laughs> I'm not going through the whole thing, man. Uh, can I explain the Drake's Bay situation? I'll let you know where it currently is. Um, basically, the decision by Ken Salazar and the Department of the Interior was to close Drake's Bay. Um, and, of course, no matter which way the decision went, it was going to be appealed. Um, the Lunny family and, and the Drake's Bay Company have appealed. They're currently in the Ninth Circuit Court appellate process in San Francisco, and the decision whether to continue the farm's operation and renew their lease or honor Ken Salazar's uh, decision to close it is in the, the hands of three people, three judges. So that's pretty much where it stands. You know, um, we can talk about specifics of why and and you know uh, that's something we should definitely talk about one on one because <laughs> I could go on forever. You know, one more. This gentleman right here. Uh, so well, that's an interesting thing. Well, the, the, the five primary species of oysters that I have, there's two different ones. There's Crassostrea, the genus Crassostrea, and the genus Ostrea. Uh, Crassostrea will generally start out male or female and then make an alteration at one point in their life, and that's what they'll be for the rest of their life. Um, the Ostrea family flips around more frequently, and they can go from male, female, male, female, usually about up to the age of three when they definitively decide what they are. Um, and the cool thing about the reproduction between them, yeah, they're, you know, they like to play around. What can you say? Yeah. Um, the cool thing about them is, is one that, uh, or at least in my opinion, Crassostrea, the, the male actually releases his sperm and the female releases her, her eggs. And they mesh in the water. They meet up in the water and create the larvae in free water. Whereas the Ostrea, the, and this is a reason why native oysters, Olympia oysters, died so quickly because the, the female actually takes, the, the, for the Olympia oyster and the, the European oyster, the female actually takes in the sperm and harvests and, and grows the eggs within the actual, you know, within her oysterdom, um, and then <laughs> spits them back out. So that's, that's a big reason why it's, it, it would happen, their, their reproduction is so much more fickle and they're, they're so much harder to reproduce. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they do change sex a lot. So... Yeah, you eat males and you eat females. Um, I've I've heard that people really good people can actually tell the species of an or the the gender of an oyster by looking at its shell. I'm not quite at that level. I don't see any defining characteristics whatsoever between male or female oyster. You know, but majority of the ones that we do eat most likely are female. I would say. Cool. Thank you very much.